Welcome back to Blockstream Talk. Today we're speaking with Ken Sedgwick from VLS, the Validating Lightning Signer Project, an open source project looking to build a body of software that anyone can use to improve the security of Lightning nodes through fully validated remote signing. The basic concept is to split out private keys from the node by asking a remote signer to sign the necessary messages, allowing VLS to protect the node's funds even if the node itself has been completely compromised. Ken discusses why operating a Lightning node is significantly more challenging than operating a Bitcoin hot wallet and how one application could be having VLS software running in a signing device. Lightning network security is probably not an issue at the forefront of a lot of users' minds at the moment, but given the growth of the Lightning network, both in terms of total Bitcoin capacity and just broader market adoption, this is an issue that will probably be more in focus and have more attention paid to it over time, especially as we get more retailers, more users, and more bigger nodes on the network. I think Ken does a really good job communicating some of these rather complex ideas. Enjoy the show and let us know what you think in the comments below. Ken, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. Good to have you. To start off, do you mind giving us a quick introduction to who you are and, and what you're working on now? My name is Ken Sedgwick, and I'm working on the VLS uh, project. Uh, I was a consultant for many, many years, got into Bitcoin around 2013, wrote a Android wallet because I wanted to learn how it worked. Uh, actually, my goals were to learn things and meet people. And I think I succeeded in both of those. Uh, the wallet didn't go very far, um, but I did uh, meet Dev Random, who's the other uh, co-founder of the VLS project. And we've been working on and off on many different projects since, but this is the most serious. Uh, and VLS has been going on for, I think, three years and a bit. I've watched one of the presentations that you have online, and I think this is maybe a good way to get into kind of the security focus of VLS. Um, what makes running a Lightning node more challenging than, say, running a hot wallet for Bitcoin? Um, so the, the main strategy for an exchange or a broker or anyone who is dealing with a significant amount of Bitcoin and a hot wallet is to keep most of the funds out of the hot wallet. <laughs> so uh, typically, an exchange will have 95 or 98 percent of their funds um, cold at any time, and they only move into the hot wallet what they need for a given um day's activity or week's activity or, 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 or you name it. Um, and that works very well because if a hacker attacks, they get 2% or 5% or something. So they don't get it all. Um, now, Lightning doesn't work that way. In order to make Lightning useful, the uh, liquidity needs to be tied up on the chain, on chain and, and it needs to be um, able to move funds by re-signing commitment transactions and exchanging them with your channel peer. Um, sort of at any time. Uh, for example, if the flea, fee market changes, um, that will cause commitments to get rewritten today so that they have different fees. Um, so those funds need to be online, hot. They cannot be removed. They can't be cold. And if you took like an, an online retailer or a really big company that had, say, a million channels, each with $100 in it, uh, now you've got $100 million on a server or a small collection of servers, um, which is connected to the internet and is busy, you know, chatting with peers, you know, uh, uh, ferociously. Um, so that's an actual pretty challenging uh, security environment. Uh, you can't make it cold and you have lots and lots of communications going on. There's lots and lots of features being added to the code. So the code has a pretty rapid velocity. Um, so Dev Rand and, my, and I looked at that and decided that that was pretty scary. We had to do something about it. Um, and since you can't take the funds cold, which is what the basic approach is usually going to be uh, with layer one, in layer two instead, we're going to try to protect the keys and protect the signing operation. So not just keys, but any other secrets that are involved um, are kept separate from the node. And when the node needs... Uh, signing operations or other similar operations, it submits them to the signer and the signer signs them. And in this fashion, the signer can be run in a, uh, a compute environment, which is much more controlled. So it may have uh, many fewer processes, isn't communicating with any, any other things. Uh, in some cases, you can connect a small embedded uh, processor with a serial line to um, 
a, a node, and then that becomes really difficult to attack. So this seems like over time is going to become a bigger issue, right? Because if you look at Lightning Network capacity in Bitcoin terms, it's just still up and to the right, right? So all of these nodes presumably are getting bigger. And at the same time, we're getting more nodes added to the network all the time. I mean, the Lightning Network is still very, very early. And so the attack uh, targets aren't there in in other words, we have to prepare for the future because the future gets harder and harder. As as more and more money is stored on a machine, um, then it becomes more and more of an attractive target. So if there's again a hundred million dollars on a machine, then a hacker can spend a million dollars doing you know various things, um, and still it's well worth his while to attack that machine. When there's only fifty thousand dollars on a machine, the hacker is probably not going to try very hard. So we haven't seen the attacks that we're going to see and we need to get ready now. Okay, that was going to be my next question. I was going to ask if there's been any big security events on the Lightning Network because I don't think I've really, you know, nothing comes to mind when I think about it. Has there been anything like that yet? Or is this something we're kind of future-proofing it? We're getting ready for something that could potentially happen later on? We're getting ready. I'm not aware of any large-scale theft going on. Um, there were definitely a couple gotchas that we had, you know, last year with uh, but they're technical. And so various nodes stopped working and had to be quickly serviced, but no money was stolen to my knowledge. Yeah. When I think of some of the, the biggest nodes like Bitfinex, I think is, is the biggest node in, in Lightning is that, you know, obviously a very sophisticated security focused player, but I guess as we get develop more and we get more, you know, retailers or people that don't have, you know, the security paranoia and expertise that someone like Bitfinex would have, that that's going to become increasingly important, right? Yeah. I, the, the evolution for especially folks who are, are new to the Lightning Network is especially steep. So maybe you're a, a publisher and you just try an L402 gateway in front of your um, material and then suddenly you're getting some Bitcoin. Everything is great. Um, but then someday you start getting a bunch of Bitcoin. Maybe you're getting, you know, 50,000 a day and it's building up. Um, suddenly it becomes a concern because you, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to learn the hard way. So is that what motivated, motivated you for the development of VLS was that you saw the market moving in this direction, Lightning Network getting bigger and bigger, and then there was nothing out there to really um, help protect people from a security perspective? That's right. It seems like the fundamental best principles that are used in other domains for security needed to be applied here. Now, there's what we're doing is not uh, you know that novel, really. <laughs> it's really sort of a, a standard idea. Um, but it was actually challenging with Lightning because Lightning, simply removing the signing operation is not good enough. And, and maybe we should spend some time on that. Is that... Uh, sure, yeah. This is blind signing versus... Uh, so it, one thing you could do is remove the signing operation to a separate box, and then the separate box would just sign everything. And that's actually fairly easy to do and straightforward and had been done before. Um, but the problem is, is if the hacker takes over the node, then he can submit various kinds of malicious messages. Um, the first thing he can do is just if he has access to the RPC, he can just send money to his own address and the signer will happily sign it. And then, you know, there you go. So uh, an another one is he could propose a closing transaction, um, which didn't fairly put either didn't give you your correct share of the uh, the channel split or sent it to the wrong place. So pretty quickly, you realize that all the signing operations have a burden that you have to understand what they mean and you have to know what the current state is. And so you can say, all right, if the signer was 40% me, if the channel was 40% me and 60% you, and we go to close it and I get 40% you know, modulo fee and you get 60%, then that's okay because I am getting the beneficial value from this channel that I expect. And so the signer can sign that. But if it sees some other uh, horrible mix, then it um, would not sign that. So the idea essentially is that even if some sort of malicious actor gets complete control of your node, you're still safe. That's correct. Our, our basic security model is that your node has been compromised. And so that's a very scary um, <laughs> uh, thing. But by using that as our assumption, that's our security assumption for uh, the most important security level we have, we, then we have to cover a lot of gaps. We have to go find all of the openings and make sure that we're checking in those situations that uh, money can't leak, money can't leak. Um, there's two kinds of issues there too, as well. Uh, one is that the, a hacker might try to steal the money, meaning send it to themselves. Who do you think is the primary audience for VLS at the moment? Is it is it retailers? Is it individual users? Is it like, um, you know, exchanges, giant nodes? 
<laughs> well, an interesting thing about the um, the VLS project, and this didn't occur to us originally. Originally, we were thinking about enterprise. So the the thing we were thinking of was the large retailer with $100 million in a machine. Let's go provide something to make that safe. But then along the way, someone said, oh, wow, so you've extracted just the state you need to do custody. Um, and therefore, you're as small as possible and establishing custody in terms of state and amount of size. And so then this allows consumer devices, which might you know be a $10 um, uh, EPS32 device, can now be run the signer, and then the node can be in the cloud. That seems like a really good uh, division of labor because the node has to gossip, needs good, you know, all, all sorts of bandwidth and, and stuff like that. And then the signer can just take care of making sure the funds are safe. And when you're talking about signing devices, are you, are you talking about things like Trezors or Ledgers or Jades, or is it other kinds of uh, hardware? Once we figured that out, we said, how small can we make it? So we've been playing with um, these, which is an S, uh, STM32 uh, relatively small. Uh, I don't know how much memory a Trezor or a Jade has, but the screen, for example, is exactly the same size as the Trezor. Um, and actually, Trezor may be an STM32. I'm not positive. I think Jade is an STM32. Anyway, by using a, a sample piece of, of gear, we can then make it as small as possible and then tell you how many channels you can have for X amount of uh, RAM. <laughs> so yeah, you can't have a large routing node running on one of these small devices, but you don't need one. You might need a dozen channels and you know, moving money a few, you know, a dozen times a day. So what, what is the status of VLS at the moment? Are you guys in beta or is it, is it, is it ready to go or? So in uh, June of this year, we did a beta release and the beta release was defined as protects your money you know, in, in as many ways as possible. So it was the bulk of the protection is in the beta release. And then what we're working on now is tuning in various specialized uses, which need extra attention. So we just finished and are, it's not quite released. We have an RC1 um, of our low reduced resource signer release. So that's meant to run on smaller things. Um, a future roadmap item will be to tune it for throughput so that if you're uh, an enterprise and have a, uh, a cost is no, <laughs> no object, but the question is how, how can we make the software scale so that if multiple channels are doing things simultaneously, that that can happen inside the signer simultaneously, get the most routed packets per second or most received payments per second. Um, I don't know if anybody needs to do bulk sending yet. Uh, that <laughs> sounds spammy to me, but <laughs> but I could see that publisher that we were talking about receiving, you know, thousands of payments a minute, um, and it needs to keep up, and all of that is great, and so that's what we'll, we'll have to tune for that and make sure that 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 works. Yeah, I'm sure there's an application for bulk spending somewhere. I'm sure there's a legitimate application other than yeah, works. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you're spending, right? So uh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, there's an economic cost, right? So, yeah. And then there are, are other specialized things. So, for example, routing nodes have some special policies that we want to work on. Um, in particular, routing nodes need to be balanced, and they, uh, you know, so the couple, there's a couple of, of administrative operations that happen on them, and the signer can be given some features which makes that easy. So, for example, with a loop out, there's a way to prove to the signer uh, that that loop out is legitimate and it should send the funds to the loop out target um, without having to write, uh, without a user having to manually approve it every time. I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning in the introduction, but you guys are not a company, right? This is an open source project. Just a project, not, not a company at this point. Um, there isn't a, a nonprofit for, you know, whatever organizational region, uh, reasons, but we are not employees of a company um, and we're just all contributing, trying to make it, make it happen. And, and what about disaster recovery? Um, you know, if, if somebody loses, uh, you know, there's node failure or something like that. What do you, what do you, what are your plans and uh, abilities in that kind of situation? So our, Charter there is to recover in all situations. Uh, there's actually quite a few different situations, so I should list which ones we're doing now and then which ones are, are on the drawing board. The basic now versus drawing board is um, sometimes you can run a signer in what Rust calls STD mode, which means it has access to standard Unix Unixy features like sockets and clocks and, and lots of memory, and you can write to disks and things like that. When you're in STD mode, the signer can do the recovery itself. So you 
let's say you're sign, you're going along, talking to a node, doing your signing and stuff, and then for some reason you decide that the node is malicious and you no longer want to work with that node. Um, you can then recover your funds by starting the signer with a command line uh, option, and it will go and close your channels and sweep the funds back to the to the wallet which you control. Uh, that that works today. That's what we've got. Uh, another very important thing, which which we still have to do, is to make it so that if you have an embedded signer or a very small signer, um, that it's not going to be able to connect to the network directly, you know, on and on and on. But what you can do is connect it to a recovery node. So you can have a node whose only purpose, it's a program that you run, which opens the socket to talk to the signer, but it's only goal in life is to you know, uh, liquidate the wallet, close the channels and get your, your funds back. Um, there's several more subtle things. Um, if you are an enterprise and have your nodes um, exquisitely backed up, so you can, if a node fails, you could connect to a different one and it would have the, the correct state, which is no small matter in Lightning because even in the slightest difference in state would cause problems. Um, if you've got that situation, the signer can just connect to the new node and all will be well there. There's different kinds of failures. So sometimes you just lose everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and other times you're being attacked. Yeah. So let's take the case where the signer itself fails. Um, one feature which is in our beta is that we store state externally as well as locally. So we're persisting locally onto whatever storage your particular signer has, but we're also sending back uh, Modif any state modifications to an LSS or VSS server. So these are cloud storage servers, basically key value um, uh, collections and their version. So they know very carefully that you're being returned the correct version of everything. Uh, of course, everything is encrypted and there's an HMAC so that we can tell that the data that you're getting back was the same data that you sent out. Um, so using that, if you had a small embedded device, say an ESP32, and it died, and you could get a new one, and then you would uh, you would have to restore your seed. So the, the, the operator will have one backup duty, which is to record the seed in any of the conventional ways. So you may choose to convert it to mnemonics and hammer it into steel, or you, you, know, you might write it down on a post-it yeah. and put it <laughs> on your... Um, but anyway, you start with a new signer, you would imbue it with the seed, you put the seed in it, and then uh, point it to uh, the storage server, and then it would be able to recover its state uh, completely and then continue operating. And, and what about Greenlight? Have you guys um, done any work with integrating with Greenlight? Absolutely. We are the signer inside Greenlight. Oh. So Greenlight and uh, the VLS project are tightly bound. Um, we're, we're delivering uh software versions to them and handling bug fixes and so on and so forth. So um, that's all coming out, you know, any day now. So the, the green light concept is that the bulk of the, the node is in the cloud. And then the uh, individual has only the smallest amount necessary to maintain custody themselves and uh, initiate operations safely. So the Greenlight has a thing called a Greenlight client, GL client, and that has the VLS signer uh, built into it. And so it's a little bit like a U. Uh, the Greenlight client will issue commands via gRPC to the Greenlight node and say, hey, I want to do this. And the node will go off to make it so, but at the point where it needs the signatures, it then will call back to the signer, which is in the GL client, and say, uh, please sign this. Uh, now the GL client can tell that that message was the, pertains to the, the command that it initiated, um, and so it can approve it, um, and then the, the process goes on. So that, that's the basic structure. Can you explain how UTXO oracles work and what they and, and what they offer in terms of security? The idea of the UTXO set oracle is to a, to um, mitigate a very specific problem. So the the problem is what's called an eclipse attack. So if you've got a Lightning node or a Bitcoin node or um, even a signer, um, an eclipse attack means we we cut you off from the world. And, and so you don't have any view of any progress. You can't see what's going on. You then can do things which are bad and the signer can't respond. So for example, you could breach a channel and take, claim the funds and the signer can't see it. So um, we needed to make sure that the signer was not breached. And we needed to make sure that it could trust um, what was in the blockchain, what, what transactions had happened and could trust that some had not happened. Um, 
So what we do, what you do is you take, you make an oracle, you take a Bitcoin daemon, and it builds a um, data collection which contains all of the current UTXO set, and then it attests to the root of that in a Merkle fashion. You know, think Bitcoin, and it uses compact filters much like Neutrino does. It's the same filter technology, Gulam uh, sets, but it's tuned slightly differently because we're, we're actually doing something a little different with it. Um, and, and it builds a proof, which can then be submitted to the signer. And so the signer can validate the signature. Uh, this is an Oracle that I trust. And then it can look at the proof and say, okay, at this time, this block was the, the tip. And I can be sure that the UTXOs that I'm interested in um, did not happen in that block. So let me spend a second on how that works. Um, normal compact filters are used by wallets when they're watching things and want to know when something happens to them. So you're watching your, your um, UTXOs in your wallet. We have situations where we need to know that, um, need to prove that something didn't happen. <laughs> so that a UTXO you care about is not in this block. And so we in we invert that in these differently tuned compact proofs. And so if you look at these proofs and say, okay, I'm interested in this UTXO and this one, then if they're not in there, they didn't happen. Um, there can be false positives. If you have a false positive with that, that kind of proof, then you have to look at the whole block and say, yeah, my stuff isn't in here. Um, but those are, are, are rare and tunable, so we can make sure they're rare. Um, Anyway, it's a long-winded story, but what it means is that even if you're an embedded signer with relatively little resource, the, the front end of the VLS system, which is running outside the embedded signer, can gather together the information it needs from the UTXO set oracles and give you a proof, which you can then use to make um, correct decisions about whether uh, a channel is correctly funded, for example, or the something something hasn't been spent yet. UTREXO project, a different project, um, is also working on a similar or perhaps the same. I think their project would work for us, but it's not complete. So we had to do our own thing. Um, so they're a new thing. People, we do not have UTXO set oracles today, um, although they would be a good thing. And I think once there are UTXO set oracles, many different applications will be able to take advantage of them because they allow you to uh, be up to date on the blockchain state without having a lot of resources yourself. And in terms of um, the validation rules implemented in VLS, uh, how can they protect against potential exploits or fraudulent activities? So there's a lot of rules, um, over 50 or something. Um, and they apply in a lot of different cases. So the closing transaction example I gave earlier, you need to make sure that you get your fair share out of the closing transaction. Um, if you're a routing node and someone wants you to send some money to downstream, you need to be able to look upstream and say, ah, yes, that's because I received just a little more than that over here. So that's legit. And I'm going to uh, make a little bit, not lose anything if I do this. Um, so all of the rules in essence are doing, but most of them are doing that. Another thing that they can do is make sure that things are well formed. So node peers exchange commitments and you're protected by the uh, commitment that your counterparty has signed because if you have to, you can sign it yourself and then go on chain. But if they've given you something invalid <laughs> in that commitment that they shared with you, actually, what they're really sharing is the signature. So if a signature is not valid, then um, that's not good. You can't actually go forward. You have to uh, rectify that right where you are because you don't have a valid uh, claim point, if you want to think of it that way. So, so the VLS has several additional messages, which are not classic signing operations. So... Uh, when the peer sends a new version of a commitment, uh, the node has to give it to, to VLS, even though it doesn't need to be signed. But VLS needs to see it so that it can uh, know that it's OK to, to allow the state to, to move forward on that channel. Uh, similarly, when the counterparty revokes their current commitment, an old commitment, um, we need to see the revocation to make sure that it correctly revokes the uh, old commitment and could be used in case of a um, a, a breach. What is the roadmap for developing VLS further? What do you guys have uh, planned in the pipeline? Well, there's a lot of stuff. Um, 
one thing we have to do is keep up with uh, Lightning protocol changes. So uh, <laughs> this month, <laughs> you know, so we, we've done we've done Bolt low level Bolt twelve support. There's high level Bolt twelve support which is coming, um, but is not strictly necessary to operate. The high level Bolt twelve support is along the lines of saying, I want to approve spending ten dollars over the next two days because I want to watch this movie. Um, and that's going to be in a series of invoices, you know, maybe hundreds or thousands as I watch the movie. Um, today, those need, you need to work out some way to approve all of those. But we'd like to add a, a high-level Bolt 12 approval where you can approve high-level concepts, and then we'll work it out in the signer to make sure, oh, yeah, this is a subpayment for that. Um, so that's okay. Um, other new features, uh, Core Lightning just released uh, splicing. Uh, Core Lightning now uses uh, P2 tap... Uh, uh, P to TR, so uh, pay to taproot addresses in the, for its wallet operations. Uh, that's not full uh, taproot support for the commitments yet. That's still coming. But for the wallet addresses, when you're holding money in the online wallet, the, they've switched to using taproot. What about multi-signature capabilities? That's big. Um, everybody wants that and for a couple different reasons. Um, let's see. One, let me go over the reasons why you want it. Why is it cool? Uh, so the idea is... Uh, in addition to removing the signer from the node, the, taking the keys and secrets and moving them out of the node, you then split it in five ways, for example, and make a multi-party computation. So as long as any three of them are honest and cooperating, you can sign things. But no one of them has anything uh, has all the required secrets uh, in order to do anything by itself. So you have to have three cooperating or four. You know you. you mix these as appropriate for your thing. So it can be much more secure. You can build a signer, which even can be, parts of it can be attacked, but the whole thing still continues to operate. Another reason why um, multiple signing might be cool is you might have signers with different um, policies or different so imagine more of a green wallet kind of thing where you've got a signer at home, which is on all the time and always accepts funds and can do, you know, sort of stuff that you're not worried about uh, automatically. Then you've got a signer on your fo on phone, which you can use to instigate larger payments and so on and so forth. Maybe you've got a signer that's offline most of the time and it's capable of um, doing bigger things. Uh, anyway, some combination of those can then be used to uh, to make sure that you have enough of uh, signing elements present so that we can make progress. So there's there's lots of interesting approaches there where um, things there's lots of tricks in there. You can use that to do asynchronous things. You can use that to um, add new features. Multi-party signing like that is actually fairly complex. It you know it uses um, Taproot. It uses um, uh, music and it might use um, frost. So <laughs> there's a. Uh, I'm not actually the the right guy to discuss this at, at much at length. I only know enough to to get it wrong or be dangerous. But but there's a, a there's a VLS matrix group which is filled with uh, 20 experts who are uh, working on this all the time. So it, it's multi team. So it's folks from all the different node implementations, and we're trying to figure out what is a minimum set of stuff that we can roll out um, to do multi-sig. Originally, there were some daunting problems, but I think we have solutions for most of them. I don't completely understand them myself, but uh, but DevRandom does and the other folks do. How big is the VLS um, group? How many people are working on this? Two engineers are uh, DevRandom and myself. We just added a third engineer who was a summer of Bitcoin student and uh, worked out real well. We had a lot of fun working with him. So we're, he's going to stay on and do uh, projects for us. Um, and then we have uh, Jack, who you've probably talked to, who is in charge of doing product management and all, you know, all sorts of, you know, media stuff and representing. And he's not an engineer, but he does everything else. So for people who want to learn more, developers, companies, um, they want to contribute or, you know, where can they go? So the right place to start is VLS.tech. That's a, our website. Uh, and it's VLS.tech, um, fairly short. Um, it, it's got further links to all the things you need, to the repositories and some blog uh, posts that describe, you know, why VLS and what is blind signing and stuff like that. Um, and we, we need people to help in all different ways. There's plenty to do technically, but there are also a lot of cases, a lot of interesting business models, which 
should be proposed. And you know, someone would say, wait, if you could do that, then you could put this there and this could happen. Um, and so we're really interested in learning about those because each of those generally comes with a different tuning requirement, you know, cost requirement. So we're trying to make sure we're as flexible as possible. So what's the appropriate channel for people to provide feedback on that kind of stuff? From the website, you'll find pointers to our matrix groups. And we have, uh, you know, a half dozen of those. There's general, if you have just general questions, stuff like that. Um, there's a dev group. So if you're a developer and you have a you know, development kind of question, uh, that would belong there. The L2 multisig group is the one which is where the uh, multisig discussions are taking place. Um, so if you wanted to know how long that was going to take or what it might look like, that would be a good place to ask. Got it. Good stuff. Well, I really appreciate your time today, Ken. That's really interesting. And uh, hope we can have you back in the future as uh, things continue to develop with VLS. Love to. Yeah, it's been fun being here and uh, it's an exciting time. Lots going on. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Doesn't seem like there's ever enough time to sleep, but but, uh, <laughs> but it's good busy and not bad busy. That's great. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.